Good morning, and welcome to another exciting edition of Day 4 with the man, Frank Scalish. <laughs> Final show before the Classic. I think you'll be driving next Thursday as you get to the Classic. Head to the Classic, right, Frank? I will be. I will be driving like a man on fire. All right. Uh, we got a great show for today. Um, a unique show. We're going to talk about a couple different things in the first part of the show. Some of which is which we didn't have to talk about. And then we're going to close it out on a very positive note. We have Dan Miguel from Great Lakes Fidesz. Some absolutely fire stuff has dropped. He's been doing the uh, he's been doing the PR tour, and I'm glad we got him on BTL. Uh, he's kind of the brains behind what I would say is the the hottest small bait brand that has just exploded over the past couple years nationwide. Very well known in specific segments of the country, but they got some right. cool stuff. So we're going to talk about that. All right. We're going to start off the show, though. Uh, if you guys have listened to day four, which 95 percent <laughs> of you listen to day you four are on this right now. One of the segments that uh, I always look forward to that I know the listeners always look forward to. And Frank, I know that you look forward to it because you're the one who who brought uh, this to the BTL day Four community uh, is the prop guy. Todd. Todd Bucknell. Yeah. And it, it you want to take it from here, Frank? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Everybody knows I made a post. Everybody knows um, Todd passed away last week. Um, he had a, he had a heart problem. He passed away last week. Um, it was it was. Um, I, I have to thank everybody who reached out. Um, it, it was astronomical. Um, Todd was a great guy. Um, he knew his stuff when it came to the prop world and running boats. But but beyond that, he was an incredible human being and, and one of my dearest friends on earth. And, um, it was, it was, you know, it's tough for his family. It was, it was a little tough on me and, um, you know, he's going to be missed. I talked with Todd's father. He wants to keep the RWS stuff going, the five blade prop going, but I told him, let's just wait a little bit, let, let the dust settle. And then, well, then we'll get back into that stuff. But um, I, I have to really uh, thank you all for for your responses on this. It was it was incredible. Um, I, I, the, I we're not going to make this a sad moment because that's not how Todd was. I mean, Todd was th that quintessential. Everywhere he went, there there was a party. So you know, we're not going <clears> to <throat> make it hard. We're just going to, we're going to push through. And, um, you know, I know for a fact, he loved this show. He loved the fans. Um, you know, it was right in his wheelhouse. So, uh, I want to thank all you guys again, uh, for your response and for your loyalty. Well said, Frank. Uh, I, I never got to meet Todd in person, but just through the half dozen times you've had him on the show and the interactions before and after the show, incredibly genuine, such a positive guy, made you feel like a million bucks, yeah. uh, very personable and seemed like a really good guy outside of the fact that he made the best damn prop in the world. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, it's, it's, uh, I, I it's funny because all winter long, you know, he would, he would call me up. He'd go, dude, what are you doing? And I go, I'm fishing. He goes, Jesus Christ, it's snowing out. What are you, are you out of your mind? It's blowing 30 miles an hour, blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah. And so then I would send him pictures of, of the fish I was catching while I was catching them. And he, he was sending them to his buddy in Tennessee and it was hilarious, man. I mean, and, but every, every morning, you know, um, we talked on his way to work every single morning. Um, he would say, I got this guy, he's running this boat. It's doing that. Um, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Every, every day was a, a project of solving something every single day. And, um, you know, it's he seemed to really enjoy his life too. Like he seemed to be very passionate about oh, it. Like yeah. he was where he wanted to be when he wanted to be there, uh, and, and was able to make it happen. 
hundred percent. I mean, he he was the quintessential guy that lived in every moment. He didn't waste a minute, and it it was re- it's, it's, it's real spectacular because you know how it is, Matt. I mean, yeah. we all get caught up in all the minutia all the time. Um, and it's hard to get out of it sometimes, you know, you get so caught up on these little things and he never really got caught up in the little things. He always pushed forward and, you know, it was always, he, you know, it was a special guy, it's a real special guy. Well said, good tribute, Frank. Uh, I know that that's something, you know, it, you're one of his best friends, probably his best friend, right? I, I won't I won't take that go that far, man. but uh but, but yeah, uh, uh, uh condolences <laughs> to his family, uh to you, to your family. I know I've talked I talked to Frankie last week after it happened and uh yeah and uh that's was, life, man. Yeah. It's it's the sad part of life actually. But, it is. But it is life. Uh all right, no easy way to transition to this, but we're gonna transition. We're just we gotta moving. Do it. We're living, we're, we're living on. in the moment, man. The next yes. moment is now. And hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we have a lot of moments coming, including the Bassmaster Classic. Uh, Bassmaster Classic Expo kicks off next Thursday or next Friday, the 22nd, Friday, Saturday, Sunday in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I know a lot of day four fans and listeners will be there. You have teased this. Uh, I've teased this. We have dates and times we will be there. There's also a limited run. A limited run. A limited run of uh, One Knocker Spooks, Lure Net, Paint Shop, Color, Number 7s that will be on a first-come, first-serve basis. We have a limited number for Saturday and a limited number for Sunday as well at the Pradco booth at the Bassmaster Classic. Frank and I will be there. What are the times, Frank? Saturday at 1230 and Sunday at noon. There you go. So get there early. Sounds Frank, like a duel. Yeah, Frank's, Frank will have six different colors of Sharpie. So depending on what color shirt or lure you have, a lot of guys were having Frank sign the the, the top of the uh, of the bait where it's kind of a, what color is that top? It's, is it a black? Does it fade to like a black top? It's like a black la- black lavender with lavender pearl, black with pearl in it. Wasn't uh, black lavender your stage name back in the day? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even touching that. I'm not okay. even going down this road, dude. <laughs> All right. Uh, if you guys have questions about that, about Tulsa, I have a couple of emails to get back at people who want to know about launches and that stuff. I mean, I'm not like a wealth of knowledge. I do know what's going on. I've been to a few of these. Uh, hit me up in the DMs at Matt Pangrak on uh, Instagram. Email me, Matt, at BassZone.com. Like I said, follow us on, on the social media for where we are, when we are. We'll also be at the Bass Tank at 2 o'clock on Saturday and 11 o'clock on Sunday. But uh, the primary one, 1230 Saturday, Pradco, and 12 o'clock on Sunday at Pradco if you guys are planning on being at the Bassmaster Classic. Please stop by. Hopefully. So here's the here's the plan. Hopefully there is a... a uh, some of the day four signature series Frank Scalich merchandise that is on a truck driving to Tulsa next week. And you'll be able to have the first look on that. The BTL store with the Frank Scalich signature series merch, as well as a new redesigned BTL logo drops on March 25th on BassZone.com. All right. You ready to talk about the hottest? Well, they used to be a small, I would love to know how Dan Miguel, uh, classifies Great Lakes finesse because well, it's like super custom and like super n- niche, but then it's absolute effective. effective has blown up and we're figuring yeah. out that it's not like just Great Lakes stuff. It's all across the country. Let's bring Dan in. Right, right. Dan, thanks for jumping on BTL. Greatly appreciate the time. Yeah, thanks for having us or thanks for having me. <laughs> how would you how would you classify Great Lakes finesse? Just give it a, a little history before we dive mm-hmm. into the new products and what's going on. Just a little bit of background and how you guys ended up with uh, 
with Pradco and and that brand because it's a really cool story. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, if you want me to classify what we are, um, I would say we're actually finesse. Um, you know, there's a, that that finesse term is thrown around loosely in this industry and, and a lot of brands make, you know, regular size baits and then they'll make a small version of a bait that's popular and call it finesse. But, um, you know, this is a style of fishing that we figured out, you know, well over 10 years ago. Um, and it's something that we've really dialed in over the years. I mean, right here where I live, um, the Johnson brothers, Cooper Gallant, um, Evan Kung, I mean, Evan's leading the opens right now. All these guys are within like 20 to 30 minutes of me. They fish against like they, this whole area is just loaded with incredible anglers because that's the level that we're all competing at here for these smallmouth. And, um, so many years ago, we kind of figured out that if we really downsized our line and went to really tiny baits like panfish baits, we could fool some of these larger fish. No one was really doing it. Um, some of the better anglers were kind of figuring it out. Um, but yeah, just really dialing in. And, you know, the challenge that we were running into as we were figuring all this stuff out was that the components and the materials weren't designed for six and seven pound smallmouth. And you know, like the crappy baits and stuff, they just didn't have really good hooks and the, the baits would tear really easily. So, you know, we started making stuff for ourselves. We started doing like little things to the baits to make them really effective. And, um, you know, there was a point where I didn't know if I was going to really try to go and, you know, fish the opens and stuff. And then mm -hmm. um, about three years ago, I had triplets. And um, <laughs> for, for, for me, personally um that was a, a a moment of reckoning where i'm like hey realistically this isn't gonna happen um i'm still in the industry i can do really cool things so why don't i start bringing this style um along with a couple guys um, we've got a team here of, of guys and and why don't we bring this new style of fishing to the angling community because really there was a huge gap in the market like we couldn't find anything that we needed and um so we knew that there was a, an opportunity and um, especially when it came to pressured smallmouth. And uh, so that's how it started. It, it really just started with, let's make some baits for ourselves. Let's, you know, we'll make them available for sale. Honestly, I didn't think anyone would even understand what we're doing. And we started an Instagram page and we just started selling baits. And I had some like local relationships here at the local dealer level, um, some local stores that, you know, supported it, threw it on the shelves and, immediately people understood what we were doing like the top tournament anglers in this area were all just buying the stuff like crazy and the dealers were selling out really quickly and it wasn't like the masses had taken to it it was like a handful of guys would come in and buy it all like they would drop a thousand dollars and um so a few tournaments locally got one and all of a sudden it just started to spread and then the elite guy like within the first couple hundred followers on our instagram page we had like two elite guys and then the orders started coming coming in from the elite guys and the opens guys. And then before we knew it, we just like we could not make this stuff fast enough. And um, you know, we were trying to scale, and um, again, like very like not spending any money on marketing, just kind of posting fish pictures and you know little clips of stuff. And before we knew it, it was just like it was insane. Like the retailers were reaching out. We couldn't take on any more retailers because we couldn't even supply the retailers we had. And um, we were, you know, a little overwhelmed, you know, to put it quite frankly, like no money on marketing, the baits were just doing their job, you know, someone would buy a pack and then next thing you know, they're coming back and they're buying 10 packs. And um, yeah, it just got crazy and we were doing our best and people were getting frustrated. If anyone's followed the brand for the last couple of years, they'll know that we've had supply challenges. And that's really just because we literally, you know, even if, as we added more people, we couldn't make it fast enough not even close and um so then pradco i actually had a relationship um uh, with them from a prior business in the industry that i'd been in i've been in the industry for a long time uh, i used to work for rapala started a company called mps as part of that company and then this is like my true passion and through that other business i knew the guys at pradco and they actually reached out to me at icast um two years ago and said hey like we see what's going on hey is there an opportunity for us to help you with, you know, what we can see is your challenge. And, um, you know, fast forward to today, we've got a great relationship with Pradco. Um, and really it had nothing to do with greed. It was all about, for me, it was about 
seeing this brand reach its full potential. And we felt that if we didn't do something like this with a company like Pradco, the stuff was going to get knocked off. Unfortunately, it's a knockoff industry. We see it. And um, if we didn't do this, other brands would just start doing it. And really, it's whoever markets first and gets in front of people. So for us, it was like, we really want, and not only that, we felt like we could do it better. Like we, even if other brands started doing it, we still felt like, we're the ones to do this and um and even now so fast forward to today we just did some product launches three days ago literally we ran 40 times the normal amount of product we would for a product intro in the past and we're already like sold out on almost everything and it's just like <laughs> here we are today yeah like exactly. almost sold out again three days after a launch and it's just like here we go again well um, you just they just got to keep checking for available inventory because it's going to keep coming in yeah it's been insane so i I, what i do want to say if there's anyone watching um that is a fan of the brand like we appreciate your support so much and um you know for me personally i've really it's been a very uncomfortable thing for me i've been fishing tournaments for over 20 years and for those years i i kept these secrets so tight to me and that was what i was used to so (laughs) this is a complete reverse like where i'm going i'm giving it all up in in the form of the baits and really these are tournament tuned baits right out of the package and um you know whether it's the finesse or sorry the matte finish on all the baits like that's a tournament secret of ours we used to rub our baits in the carpet of our boat for a tournament we figure out how to get rid of that glare in the manufacturing um the true neutral buoyancy which makes our drop shot baits and baits so you want to sit level in the water they sit perfectly level and then even the boat baits that float they float just enough it's not like they stand straight up and look goofy like we've put a lot of effort into this so we want to just thank everyone who supported the brand and, and what we're doing and the feedback and um, just the messages and everything we get on a daily basis is overwhelming and we truly appreciate it. The thing that I the thing that I found so amazing to me because the first product that I fished of yours um, was the drop minnow, and um, I can't believe how durable that, that is. I mean, it's it looks frail. But it, it, it was the durability of that was so amazing to me. Um, that kind of really impressed me because as durable as it is, it quivers and moves perfectly. And you, you wouldn't know it. Yeah. I mean, every angler, especially smallmouth angler, can relate to that um, challenge of having a soft bait. We know that these fish are big schooling fish. And there's nothing worse than having to pull a new bait out of a package when you've got a bite happening right in front of you. So you're right. Like that that drop minnow, we can catch upwards of 20 fish on one. And uh, that that is the difference when you're in a tournament. And that means you might get that extra bite you need to win. Right. 100%. Frank, does the tail movement on that remind you of the days of black lavender? Look at that. <laughs> Look at the tail movement right there. See that right there? Boom. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, we're going down a wormhole, dude, <laughs> or, or a drop minnow hole. <laughs> yeah. Dan, I will say, so, I mean, you guys are in, in my opinion, if I was to put the, the three biggest success stories, and you guys are still, like, young, right? But yeah. uh, I'm looking back on three would be uh, Ron Davis and Rad Lures and the Chatterbait teaming up with Z-Man and literally getting to the point where they're like, dude, everyone's pissed at us because we're – delivered baits that are sold before they even get there and guys are buying a ton and z-man came in but they still had their hands in exactly how it was designed and what it was the other one is that that's also recent is that kgb chad shad and kind of their uh work with spro bringing it to it i mean but primarily the chatter bait like i put this along kind of the same lines as something that was a very regional localized bait that a lot of people didn't understand but they protected it and then they brought it to the market and the thing blew up. Were you surprised at how much it's, it's blown up across the country? Like, does it shock you at where you're getting different orders and where people are using this stuff specifically because of how it was designed for, you know, that great lakes region and small mouth specifically? A hundred percent. Um, I, like I said, every day I, I I'm shocked at how, this is just blown up and not just like you said in the great lakes region i mean obviously very effective here local dealers just they 
place this brand right in the front of their store because they know it sells really great. But I mean, a great example is like Toledo Ben. Um, Luke Palmer just got a sixth place and the drop minnow was a, a critical bait for him. And uh, yeah, we're really starting to see it. Evan Kung um, just got a, a top 10 with the drop minnow as well. And uh, we're that one of the uh, the Bass High School events. I think the guys from Michigan, they got a third. They were using the drop minnow. So the drop minnow specifically has just gone crazy. And I mean, we're seeing people from California, Florida, like, you know, the middle of the country um, in the U.S., like the Kentucky Lake, like all those regions, like these are really starting to become a player. And I think it was almost the perfect storm because not only did we introduce this super finesse light line technique that is used with and without forward facing sonar, all of a sudden the forward facing sonar craze just went off and it was just like, I, it just took this whole technique and finesse to a whole nother level. Like all these spinning rod techniques are just, they're huge now. And this plays right into the forward facing sonar game a hundred percent. Yeah. It's, I got some buddies of mine that throw it for spotted bass and then they're, they're plowing them on it. Just plowing them on it. Yeah. All right. Uh, big news as far as new products that are that are hitting. Talk about the need. I mean, you already had four, five, six great selling products. What was the reasoning behind wanting to add to it? And then uh, talk a little bit about the logistics and what makes the new uh, GLF baits as effective as as they are. Yeah. Um we basically i've had these ideas and, and our team has had these ideas for a, a long time well over a year our challenge was we just could never find the time to bring them to market because we couldn't keep up with demand on the current items like the snack rod drop minnow tube heads and the sneaky underspin um so finally having you know pradco and the resources to to develop in-house with a strong team um i mean really our mission is just to continue and, and really own this super finesse category that's like jdm level quality but the designs and the colors are tuned for our market and that's one of the challenges that we have with like even myself fishing a lot of the jdm stuff I went to japan i was blown away by the stuff there but um it just wasn't really tuned for our fisheries so um yeah so we've introduced which is has blown me away um i mean i'm not shocked but i am kind of shocked is this new juvie crop and this thing is a is an absolute killer it's uh it's, i mean it seems so simple um it, it's a tube which has really not been an exciting bait category for well over 10 years and um you know the top anglers are fishing the mini tubes like the 2.5 and, and even smaller in some cases but 2.5 seems to be the average and um you know we we've always found that that there's these fish really love to be little juvenile crawls like really small ones and uh so a tube is so versatile. So if we could make a tube that looks like a juvenile craw, we felt like that would really help us win tournaments. And um, and we have so many scenarios where that plays. So whether you're fishing dragon sand or rock or you're around some weeds or, you know, even, you know, pitching up against docks. Um, there's so many times where a tube is versatile. You can add scent and you can do really cool tricks with them. Uh, you know, people get really creative with tubes, adding stinger hooks. So to be able to merge a tube with a, a juvenile craw with the matte finish and also what separates this from a normal tube is we've actually added the the buoyancy to it so the tentacles will lift and the claws will lift a bit so a tube is generally scented so it doesn't it just kind of falls and settles whereas this will actually lift so it's a completely different look from what people would normally see with a, a regular tube yeah i have one live right here it's yeah. smaller than so everything that I've noticed with the GLS stuff is if you're not used to it, it's smaller than you expect it to be. Is that a fair assessment, Dan? Absolutely. It's I mean, even on the cam, like we're we're Frank showing it just doesn't do it justice how small it is. It really is designed to mimic those little tiny craws that um those fish are coughing up in your live well or you're seeing them spit up beside the boat. Those are the ones like most of the baits on the market are significantly larger than this. Now, Frank, you've done a bunch of tube shows. Well, you've done, I think, two or three uh, tube shows in the past. But I don't think you've really 
dove into the baby tubes. I know we did micro crankbaits last week, but that two and a half. Well, yeah, but that's something that you've been doing. Uh, well, oops, sorry. That's something that you've been doing on Lake Erie for a long time. Yeah, for a very long time. So the cool thing about this is um, the head design from Great Lakes. In my opinion, this tube head is absolute money because the way it lays down on the bottom, it, it keeps the hook point upright. And a lot of the a lot of problem when you're sliding a tube is a round head will have a tendency to roll the hook over on you. And then it hangs on to everything. But the way this thing is designed, it lays like this on the bottom and it actually fishes like this, um, which is the beauty part about when you're putting it in the craw or you're putting it in a small tube, it still wants to ride hook point up. It'll yeah. still want to ride hook point mm -hmm. up on you. And that's critical because a lot of times, like, a lot of times what you, where you're throwing this thing is patches of sand and gravel. And what you'll have in there is there's going to be grass mixed into that. And so this pr helped prevent it from always snagging up in the grass. And then if you're fishing chunk rock, keeping that hook point up stops it from hanging up on them little tiny rocks. So well, it's what time sweet. of the year are you going with a juvenile craw with a small craw, Frank? Like, when are you going to downsize your baits? Uh, and, and let's say you could go for any tube, and sometimes you'll want to use a three or a four inch tube. When are you going to go with like a two and a half inch tube like this? Well, the crazy enough thing that I found out was back in the old days, the bigger the tube, the better I liked it. And I was literally throwing flipping tubes on the lake. Now, that eliminated a lot of bites too, because the tubes were huge. What I'm finding out now is that I'm catching way better quality on the smaller stuff and way more consistent on the smaller stuff. The thing that Dan said that's really relevant is when the bass, you put the smallies in your live well, even the spotted bass, and they start regurgitating crayfish up. They're not giant crawdads. They're little. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're little. and And so that that's kind of where the bell went off you know but but like the other thing is this stuff wasn't developed to the magnitude that glf has it developed to today so we were using um the, back then the smallest tube we could get was an original gets it and mm -hmm. then and then a, a crappie tube which is way too small um, so, you know, now, now with all this stuff coming into play, um, it, it's pretty sweet. I mean, it's pretty sweet. Yeah. I, I just want to add to, um, to what Frank was talking about. So that mini pro tube head has become our, like one of our top terminal sellers. And, um, so that will make a, a regular tube sit flat on the bottom. And what, what, it, what anglers will find is that not only will it not snag nearly as much, you'll probably reduce your snags by like 75%, but also your hookups will be significantly better because that's a short shank hook and it always gets them in the roof of the mouth and in the meat. And uh, you just, you won't lose nearly as many fish to shake offs. The second thing with the juvie craw, we took it even further. So not only now do we have a flat bottom tube head, we actually incorporated a flat bottom in the juvie craw. So that makes it even more like it'll make it stand up even more. So I don't know if you can see like yep. the bottom is actually flat. And um, that was actually an adjustment we made around version six. We made about 10 revisions <laughs> of this bait. This was the most time consuming and most costly product um, that product Pragto has ever developed in the soft bait category by far. The this two, bait. really? Yeah, I yeah. don't doubt it because there's a lot more that went into this than people realize. Um, d design standpoint, like like a guy can design something, and if the people that are making it don't understand the concept, it may look the same, but it doesn't do the same. I, I had a product that came out a long time ago, which I will not mention, Um they utilized my design but they didn't understand the mechanics of it and they changed one thing and they discontinued it because it didn't work 
because they didn't understand the mechanics. And that's why I could see this took a, <laughs> took a minute. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because yeah. it's important to get it right. Yeah. I mean, I'll give you a really good example of how dialed in this thing is. So, um, you know, at first glance, you're thinking, oh, that's just a tube. You know, a regular tube is just dipped and then it's it's the same consistency throughout. Well, our engineering team was able to make this part of the bait where the hook pops out thicker, but the middle of the bait is thinner so that it collapses down. So you get a bigger, um, a wider gap when they do bite down. But then also the nose of the bait where the hook is coming out, we made that thicker for a couple of reasons. One is we wanted that hook to stay there when you're casting and you're hooking a fish and you're removing the bait. And then second, we also want to give you the option to go weedless. So if you want to tuck the, the hook into the, that little piece of meat there, um, you're able to do that. So the, th the claws oh, are no. thicker. So it, it just, a lot more went into this. Like even the bottom here is thicker. This part inside the tube mm -hmm. is thicker because you're dragging along rocks and shells and whatever. So we just wanted to make sure it held up. And then also all these little scuff marks on it. I mean, the, people think, oh, that's just design. Well, that's actually intended to be fish teeth that have ripped up the bait. Because we find that as our baits get more chewed up by fish, they get more effect, they become more effective. So we we just wanted to add those little scuff marks to actually imitate those, you know, those teeth marks on the bait. And so all those like little tournament secrets and stuff, you know, we people aren't even realizing, but they're getting these tournament tuned baits right out of the package. One of the questions that's come up a couple of times on the instant feedback, you've mentioned it, is the matte finish that takes off the gloss. How difficult was it to get the matte finish and why do you feel like it gets more bites and just kind of talk about that whole process because you don't see very many flat plastics? Yeah, um, I'm not going to speak to to that because it really is our, our secret sauce. Um, okay. Uh, so I, I can't really give up like it was interesting to figure out how to do it. And, um, you know, obviously when we figured it out, it was, it was a game changer for us, for us, um, things in nature aren't trying to scream at the fish bite me, um, you know, a craws and down there yelling and, and shaking its claws and, and saying they're, they're really trying to blend in. And, and when it comes to the matte finish, like things, most things underwater actually aren't shiny, they're dull and they're trying to blend in. And, um, you know, smallmouth especially are masters of their environment. They know, what's down there and there we almost want the fish to feel like it found it like it it, it wasn't the bait <laughs> they called the fish in we want the fish to feel like oh i see you i'm getting you and that's really what triggers mm -hmm. the biggest ones because you know if you're screaming a bait down there that fish is like yeah i've seen this before but if they feel like oh i found you i'm coming to get you that's really when you're going to be able to turn a, a, an off a fish that's not in the right mood into a biter yeah so, trick or treat <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so yeah i mean that really i mean that we it is so obvious for us like we've done this for many many years and you know a lot of these lakes get a lot of pressure and for me i knew long ago especially when no one was really onto the mat and, and rubbing all the baits we would rub baits for an hour and a half before a tournament just to make sure all our baits were ready to go for the tournament and guys could be fishing right beside us and they could even see what we're using, but they wouldn't know we had done that. And we'd be out fishing them so hard. And we had no problem with people being around us because of that one thing we were doing. So, yeah. yeah so you get, you're giving out, you're, you're making these things. Like you said, they're, they're ready. They're tournament ready. Uh, yeah. All right. So Frank, uh, Lurnet has come out with a Helgramite that was in one of the recent banking Creek bags. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I'll be honest, like the Helgramite, unless I'm drastically missing something, is not uh, a staple in Oklahoma where I am. But uh, why don't you two talk a little bit about why a Helgramite is effective? That's one of the other drops, the 2.4 inch juicy Helgramite. Uh, interesting bait. More specific or is this something that would still work across the country in Oklahoma? I just have to give it a try. It's 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 the most natural thing that you have in a lake. It's the larva stage. Like, do top. I have helgramites in Oklahoma? Oh yeah, you have them. This, really? This, yeah this this helgramite is <laughs> one of the most realistic looking ones I've seen in a long time. This is a good helgramite. Um, again, it's true to true to form. It's small. It's it's finessey. 
um, just, you know, true to form for Great Lakes. Um, but, you know, the Helger mite is a really misunderstood animal. A lot of people, um, like you can't fish river systems without having Helger mites in them. That's, that's where they live. And the, what, I, what I found out was that the smallmouth on the Great Lakes eat them just as good as the smallmouth in the rivers do. Uh, there's no difference. There's no difference. Um, you know, I think, I think, um, I'm going to let Dan talk on this one. Um, th this is a great looking body. This is a great looking Helger mite body. Of course, I, I am holding the, the head, the pinchers, which I don't want to do, but I am. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll speak to it. Uh, the Helger mite is a bait that we've kept secret for a long time. Um, it's a category I've obviously really paid attention to because there's a handful of companies that make a Helger mite, but for what we want to do up here in the north, especially with smallmouth, um, I, I just never found one that I really liked. They either, you know, either the shapes were like off, or they were they would sink like crazy. They'd have no action, or they would float like crazy and stand straight up like a Ned, and um, just nothing ever really made sense for me. And something that I always felt was the drop shot was a player. Like we'd try to use some of these baits with a drop shot and they would eat them, but it just never really was consistent for us. So um, the two biggest thing, well, three things that really separates this Helger mite from all of the others that, I mean, there's not a lot, it's really an underserved category. Like there's not many bait companies that are doing Helger mites, but for us, it's one smaller. There's not, there's none that are designed for bass and, and like tournament game fish, like that we're fishing for, like, large mouth small mouth spotted bass whatever um in this two point this is basically a two and a half inch it's 2.4 inches the matte finish which is huge for me is a, is a game changer um even the baits that we were trying to buy and use we try to like rub the shine off but it's very difficult when you got all these little legs and appendages that's you, you can't achieve that really and then the third thing is the drop shot is where i find the helger mite shines like crazy so being able to incorporate our true neutral buoyancy so it sits perfectly level without having to move it like as soon as we got this bait and we were drop shotting it out on the great lakes like on, like on lake ontario it was instant like the first prototype boom they're eating it and it was like every fish that saw it was like on it immediately and um we just had to we only had so many prototypes and we had to we actually had to stop fishing them because we were running out of them too quickly and my tournament partner matt was like give me another one and he's like can we get more for tournaments and we got like a handful that we used in tournaments and they they actually played and like we fished like i said i've got three kids um they're just about to turn three and matt's got two and we only fished four events last year but we won three of those four tournaments um and this was a a big player for us as much as the juvie craw is an incredible bait Mm -hmm. the Helger mite is really sneaky good and uh the top guys around here have known about that for a little while here we kept it really secret uh yeah so we did i did uh, a we did an episode on the the biology of a Helger mite matt a while back yeah so if people want to look at it go go see it it's it's we did about, i did not remember that yeah we did um where was i I don't know. I talked about the Dobson fly and was I diagrams. Here? I, I was watched I with it. You? I watched that one. Was I there, Dan? Yeah, you were there. Oh, oh yeah, you guys oh. talked about it. Yeah. Oh, I apologize, Frank. I'm sorry. I'm sure it was a riveting episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I apologize. I, That's all right, I, dude. I mean, we, you guys are telling me about it. I believe you, but I do not remember it at all. Yeah, because I wanted to cover the biology of the animal not necessarily the lure the, the biology of the animal um because there's little sneaky things about this bug that people don't realize like um if you're if, if you're a, if you're a, a stream or a river fisherman for example okay the first major thunderstorm in the summer they they start to migrate the helger might start to migrate out the river that's their most vulnerable time in a river system because most of the time they're clinging to on or underneath rocks and obstructions in the water. But when that first thunderstorm breaks, it's time for them to actually turn into the Dobson fly. So they have to get out of the water to do so. So you've got this mass migration of these two and a half to four inch insects coming out of the water. 
and that's the most vulnerable time ever. So, so if you're a, if you're a river fisherman or a, you know, Creek fisherman or something to know that will put you in a fishing situation that you can only dream of in, in those, in those river did, systems. So did you talk about all this in the show? Oh yeah. 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 I had diagrams in the whole nine yards. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> we, I said, so we, no, I like I watched that and I used that show as like I was learning from that show and that part of those ideas came from that show for this bait. Outstanding. Nope. <laughs> yeah, I watched it. I'm Googling this. See, everybody, yeah. everybody, no matter how good you are, everybody can learn something. That's the most important thing about fishing is you're you're never you never know too much to learn more. That's part of the reason I love this. That is true. So I feel like the more you actually learn about fishing, the more you realize that you are only scratching the surface. Like what I have found is the anglers, the new anglers, not not a rip on any anglers, but the newer anglers who are have only been in it a couple of years are the guys who are like, oh. I got it figured out. I know everything there is. I'm an expert on this fishing. I've dedicated the last couple of years to it, man. You, you start talking to the real veterans and, and, and the more you get into this, the more you realize, the more, you know, the more you don't know. That's a hundred percent true. I always said to my, my son, I said, when you meet the angler that thinks he knows everything, you're going to beat him because they fail to grow after that fishing fishing is like a set of stairs and and as you progress in your fishing stage you climb another step and then you, you'll reach a point where you plateau for a while until something else goes off in your head and then you start to make your step climbs again so a, a beginning angler his trajectory is almost vertical because he knows very little so anything he learns he's got a vertical trajectory the more you start to know the flatter your curve gets and then you and then if you if you don't become interested in the learning game you plateau mm -hmm. and, to, and so that's the whole key um you know like i i i like I like learning new things all the time fishing. That's why I like to fish with other people because they throw insight into my game to help me improve. Like when Matt, when you and I went crappie fishing with live scope, mm -hmm. um, that opened up a whole nother opportunity for just me. Cause I know everything there is to know about crappie fishing. But, so but you I know, literally just taught but, you a little bit like there's nothing else to learn i know it all but but that's what i'm saying but you, you <laughs> taught me and you taught me enough to get started now mm -hmm. so then i started researching the crap out of it and then i started applying it so this is interesting frank so i went i went crappie fishing with zeke anderson big time tournament angler he works at the bass tank and and i've been crappie fishing for like this for three or four years i thought i had it pretty dialed in this is exactly what we're talking about. I go out with Zeke. Dude, if you came out with me now, I learned so much in an afternoon with him. We're using different line, different weights, different baits. Every single thing we're doing is different than when me and you went because you're always learning. You're always right. adapting. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. This is, uh, I'm going to hit you with a, no one, no one else ever. No one gets to do that. There's, there's my, whoa, that's right. There it is. New veteran. <laughs> Know nothing, know all. That's how I think the curve is in fishing. When you're new, you don't know anything. Then as you get into it, you start to, to feel like you know it all. And then the longer you're in it, you start going back up the curve. But it's harder to go back up the curve because on the way down when you're new, God, how do you do this every show? When you're new That's on what... the way down, you're learning You're learning on such a rapid basis. It's easy, right? Other way. <laughs> It's God, you are talented. It's easy when you're going down, right? And then you get to the point where you kind of plateau, but you think you know it all, you're not learning. And then you get in and you start learning more, but it's harder because you're learning it in smaller increments. You're not learning big giant chunks. That's my diagram right. for, for learning fit. I'm sure that that works in any skill that you want to get in, whether you're a welder, a painter, a doctor. Well, hopefully not a doctor. Hopefully you stay. <laughs> But you know, you know what I'm saying? Like I feel like that's a I feel like that's a pretty fair uh fair curve right there. Well, I mean I mean Dan uh, 
this would apply to your designs for a Great Lakes finesse. Same thing. You had a need. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, what people probably don't even realize is that we're still learning. Um, and they're kind of going through that learning journey with us as we introduce more products and and play around with what we're seeing. Like with as we bring in these these products, we're starting to see other things that we might need. And and we're always learning. And you couldn't have said it any better. I mean, I feel like I, I still know nothing. Um, and uh, yeah, we, I mean, we're just going to keep pushing, keep learning. And um, yeah, you couldn't have hit it any, like that. That curve is it's completely accurate. Yeah, it's it's neat. That's that's the beauty of the sport. Um, that that's the beauty of what we do, really. Um, because like m- my wife says, how can you go fishing all the time? Don't you ever get bored? <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> like, no, <laughs> not at all. You know, um, y- you know, you you apply a lot of your stuff. You you apply a lot of what you see in nature to to your GLF brand, Dan. Um, yeah. It likens me to because I do a lot of color schemes and and hard bait designs, but it likens me to when I was when fly fishing for the first time in the ocean. Um, I wasn't catching fish, and I saw a school of pilchards swam by me in in the water when I was waiting, and I looked at them and looked at them, and they and the the, the tide was ripping, so they got behind me where I created a current break and they all settled behind me and I was watching them in the water for a few minutes. I got out of the water. I ran up to the, to a tackle shop where I was at and they didn't have any fly tying material. So I looked at all their synthetic fiber uh, jigs and stuff that they were selling. And I bought a pile of them and I cut them all up and used the material to tie my own flies. Uh, That afternoon when the tide was going back out, I ran out there and fished the flies that I made and absolutely railed them, railed them. And, and that was because I watched the environment and not, I didn't look at what the bait fish looked like when I took them out of the water. I looked at what they looked like in the water and that's what I wanted to duplicate what they look like. That's what you're talking about. The matte finish, how they sit in the water, how they move is same, same stuff. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I resonate with all that, right? Um, you know, all these baits are, you know, we're always trying to look at what the bait's doing and what the bait does, like that bait fish or the craw or whatever it does to trigger the fish. I mean, we've watched thousands and like tens of thousands of smallmouth follow our baits and um, like even learning like the snack craw, for example, like we don't want the bait to lift like this. I've seen baits where they lift like this and the smallmouth turn away. Well, ours, like the little snack craw here, those claws just lift a little bit and when they face that fish that's nose down on it it's like instant and that's um you know we've caught more fish over seven pounds on this bait than really anything that we've got in the lineup i mean that might change as we go but this little craw is just we yeah it's been absolutely insane so really mimicking the environment and, and the actual movements of these baits is the craw like the og in the lineup like if you were to just like pick one product that's the like like that that's kind of your baby is that the one that kind of started it all i would say the i mean all all four of the starting lineup were the og really um okay for the for the craw i mean that's the one that resonates with people really easily and i think that's why it's really taken off it's just easy to understand um i mean the the sneaky underspin i mean if anyone has thrown this for smallmouth, you'll quickly realize this is the next hair jig trend. Like it's going to be that big for smallmouth. And what really separates this underspin, I mean, it doesn't seem like much. There's other underspins on the market, but what really separates this one is um, the components and how specific we were with them. So one is the quality of the blade because we want to move this thing really, really slow. But probably even more important is the hook. And most finesse underspins on the market are designed for largemouth spotted bass and they go with a large thick shank hook but we're using like we've got rods that we've custom made for ourselves that are up to eight feet and we're long bombing these with five pound test braid to like six pound test fluoro and we find that the those long long casts the biggest fish usually bite right when like the first couple cranks in so with those larger 
hooks, like those thicker gauge hooks, we just, we couldn't get good hook penetration with the light rods and the light line. So we went down to a finer wire Gamagatsu hook and it basically sets itself. You, you basically don't even need to set the hook. You're more just reeling into the fish and then applying pressure similar to a drop shot. And uh, we found that those small details really make a big difference. So our, our landing percentage with, with one of these is like into the 90s. Um, whereas some of the small ones, the finesse ones that were de designed in like California or down south for those largemouth fisheries, they just, they're not designed for the tough mouths of those big, giant, small mouth and to withstand those, those jumps and when they throw the hooks. Um, it was really the heartbreaker for us using those, those little underspins will get bites, but it's almost like fishing a frog in pads. Like it, it you just felt like your, your heart was broken all the time. <laughs> yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah. So, but I threw, uh, I said, I threw the banner up there, um, for what is stock on lurenet.com, uh, loyal listener code BTL24. I did hear from a couple of people that it didn't work on their phone, but it did work on their laptop or their iPad. I don't know if that could have just been like an individual deal or what, but if not, try it. It's capital BTL24, 15% off regularly priced items. You can go to lurenet.com to check all this, but you can also, uh, if you notice what I've been pulling up there, go to greatlakesfinesse.com and there's in-depth videos uh and then it links through lure net but some really cool stuff available there uh can you talk about your just your straight up jig heads too because they're yeah they're kind of unique it's almost like the are they powder coated yeah so all of our baits i mean we're fishing for smallmouth we're, we're hitting the bottom we're hitting rocks with them so they're all powder coated and baked um there's a lot of detail that goes into those whether it's our ball head or our new uh our this is our new hanging basically like Domiki hanging a minnow whatever you want to call it head um they're all powder coated baked so they don't chip they got three eyes and also in the manufacturing process we cover the eye um so that way there's no residue at all in there when you go to tie your line on so that's really critical when you're using a light line like four or six pound test line even down to three pound test you don't want anything in there that could compromise you're not, even if you're, you know, with paint, like jig heads that are painted, if you go to poke those out, you might damage the inside of the eye, which will, you know, you'll, you won't even know that you broke off because of that. So those are little details that, um, people don't really think about, but are in there. And, uh, and then we also, so that I, I want to talk about this hanging head, uh, okay. that we've got. So what separates this one from all the other ones again is the finer wire hook. So this is a scenario that I think people can resonate with. How many times have you gone offshore, you get onto this juicy spot, you see all the fish around you and they're just not biting. And you think, oh, it must be the bait or whatever. We've actually found that downsizing our line makes a huge difference. And there's times where we'll go down to three pound test line. The problem is just like the underspin with those thicker gauge hooks um, that are designed like this, we just couldn't get good hook penetration so these ones have a finer wire hook for the light line and the, and we are actually using light rods when we're doing this technique, because just like if anyone steel heads or, or whatever, you want the rod to absorb the shock because that three pound test can't do that. So we're using whippier rods to do this technique so that we can achieve a good landing percentage. So that's really, it really is a super finesse take on a head that a head design that's kind of like other people are doing but didn't really feel like feet um fit the gap like it didn't fill our need and now we've got that and that also is also with our swim bait head that we just released so that's like our sneaky underspin head and what's unique about it is the eye is right at the front of the hook most swim bait hooks are at the in the middle mm -hmm. that what this allows is not only your bait to swim true through the water but also when you're around vegetation, you won't get those little pieces of weed stuck in between the eye and your line. And um, so you can actually pull it through cover like weeds, milfoil up here is really prevalent and you won't get those little pieces stuck. So you're actually getting more bites because you're not wasting your cast if you're on weeds. Little details that no one thinks about. It is. Uh, Frank, you talk about like downsizing and downsizing your line a lot. Is that something that we talked about learning as an angler that you've done later in your career than you did early on was go to that lighter stuff yeah what i found out was um it, basically i started lightening things up 
at certain times out of necessity. Um, certain baits don't run properly with heavier line. Mm -hmm. um, they just don't run properly. And then the other thing too, is that like here, like in the winter time, I have a technique where I'm using six pound uh, fluoro and I'm, I'm snatching like, like the craw, I'd be sliding it on the bottom. When I come in contact with the grass, I just pull on the rod and shake it. And it poofs through the, um, winter vegetation and it and it's an open hook and it actually comes right through it um mm -hmm. but when but when i went to i started out with 10 pound fluorocarbon and i caught a couple went down to eight i started catching more but not great when i went to six i started slaying them and so i always use six on it and that's just what I did. And you'd be surprised because I'm literally dragging this thing through the grass on the bottom. And it's like Dan said, I'm, I'm using a seven and a half, uh, four power power, 764. Mm -hmm. It's got enough tip flex where I'm not going to break the line on the hook set because really all I'm doing is I'm reeling and leaning into the fish. I'm not cracking them. I'm just leaning into them and okay. fighting them in. Um, you know, and that's, that's really how I started doing that. And then of course we talked on one show about, uh, finesse Carolina rigging. Um, I remember that one. I wasn't a fan of it, but I remember that one. I know you're not a fan of it, <laughs> but, but th there again, that was taking my real Carolina rig set up and shrinking everything down. Main line size, leader line weight size. Yeah. That's um, like giving up in a, just a less manly way. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Matthew. I'm just kidding. I got it. I can't, it. Hey, I can't wait a, to get you on a Carolina rig bite. I hear you. I'm with you. There's a couple of people, Dan. Are you are you cool with like actually like running through what rod you actually use? I mean, you can name brand power. You can do whatever you want on that. You get open floor. Yeah, I mean, I mean, generally, um, I'm very comfortable with longer rods. Um, so like I'm the shortest I'll go is like a seven foot for like medium medium light um for this stuff specifically if you wanted to buy one rod and probably mm -hmm. fish all of this reasonably effective like a seven six medium light fast action would serve you really well with a size 2500 spinning reel because you're you know that that's kind of the average setup i mean i've got custom rods that are eight foot i've had built on quality blanks and components that i feel maximize my casting distance because i feel like every foot extra that i get on a cast i almost increase my probability of catching the big fish like it's almost like every foot is an extra percent chance in my mind um so that's yeah that would be the average setup like that seven that seven uh four to seven six would be completely fine for people to uh to use Fat, on all this medium stuff. fast action medium light medium, medium light. light yeah and a good quality spinning reel. That's really important. If you're going to invest, that's where you really need to invest is in a really good one with a, a good drag. Cause you, the, like I said, a lot of these little hooks, um, they set themselves. So you don't need mm -hmm. to like, you don't need to like hammer them and you don't need to put a lot of pressure on those fish. In fact, this is kind of a little secret that we have is we find the more pressure we put on a smallmouth, the more crazy it goes. And when we don't put much pressure on a smallmouth, it almost comes to the boat, doesn't jump very much. And like we almost net them before they even realize they're hooked. It's it's funny. Like you think the opposite. Most people think I got to hammer that fish to the boat, get him in before he jumps off. We're the opposite. Let's let them play. Let's let them not, don't put too much. Like we put pressure on these fish. Don't get me wrong, but our, our drags are, are backed off. So if you watch any of our videos, you pretty much hear a drag screaming the entire time. And that's intentional. Uh, here's as, as a Southern guy, there's a lot, I think a lot of people in the Midwest, I'm about to make, uh, you guys at Prad code lured and had a bunch of money here. I'm not, I'm not a fan of kits. I, I mean, I am, but not as a tournament angler, right? Like right. I want like a kit. Like if you want to go to do the Creek and bank, like that's a, a cool kit, but it's not tournament. This stuff is a tournament kit waiting to happen. There's tons of guys who go up to Lake Ontario and Thousand Islands for a week 
or I've got an open up on Lake St. Clair or Lake Erie. I want to have those jig heads and the baits because I can look at it and not, I want to have like a kit that I can buy it and be good and say, here's the thousand Island kit. That's got a couple sneaky underspins in it. That's got, you know, whatever I'm going to use out drop shot. And when I go up to St. Clair, when I have a kit with some of the, the, the tubes in it and stuff, I think those would fly off the shelf. When you talk about Northern guys, Southern guys who know how to fish, but don't know how to buy Northern tackle <laughs> because the first couple of times I did it up there, like, I didn't have what I needed. And I'd call Travis Manson and he'd be like, come on, bro. Like everybody does that up here. And I'm like, no, we don't. Like, it's kind of weird up here compared to what <laughs> everyone does down south. It, it is. It, it is. I mean, our, our fishing up here, um, it, I want, I don't want to say it doesn't translate below the Mason Dixon line. Um, because, because I take a lot of this to the spotted bass fisheries and just plow them. Yeah. Um, so it's equally as effective, um, and for the Southern range smallmouth too, it's equally as effective, but, um, but there's a, it's a different kind of fishing. Great lakes fishing is a different kind of fishing. Am I off base with the kit? I, I don't oh. like uh, kits at all. <laughs> I know, but, but this, listen, this is a unique brand with a, it's different than the average. Like this is stuff that needs to be paired together in the right size and the right shapes and the right colors. And dude, if I can spend a hundred bucks and know that I'm covered, I, I'm, I'm making that investment on a kit. I'll, I'll think about it. I'll and I'm a guy who's never it. bought a kit in my life. I know yeah. that's not true. I bought the banjo minnow kit and I smoked you, them out of Rock Pond. <laughs> <laughs> this is as a child, as a child. You and my father. But, uh, yeah. I don't yeah. know if this is something that's like sneaky. There's also been a couple guys, Dan, that have asked about uh, when the hair jig, when the hair jig is dropping. Is there okay. a hair jig that's dropping? Is is that on the radar? Um, I mean, I'm not going to rule anything out. I've got a four year plan of products that I'm dying to get out. So. I'm not going to say it's not or isn't like it. I think here, I'm going to give a, a real sneak. Luke Palmer is going to kill me. Um, but so this is something that has pretty much replaced the hair jig for me. And, and I'm not knocking the hair jig because I was a super fan of the hair jig. I've got 200 that I've tied myself of every color you can imagine. And I don't think I've opened that box in two years. And this is something that I call this, like we call the Cindy rig. It, I'm going to tell you the story here real quick, but it's funny because I, I know where this originated from. And now it's like everywhere. Bassmaster, Wired to Fish, Bass University. There's been like, if you want to look up the Cindy rig now, you can find out. Actually, we just did a blog on the Cindy rig. And this this bait is actually the exact setup that Palmer used on St. Clair to get second. And in my opinion, the only reason why he didn't win that event was because Sefuentes made long runs and he didn't have pressure around him, whereas Palmer had half the field around him yeah. and he outfished everybody. But so this is a really sneaky bait and basically it's our stealth ball jig head, or you can now use our small, our new little swim bait head. And all you do is you cast it out like a hair jig and you reel it back steady. You don't impart any action in it. It sounds so dumb. Most people would never even consider doing this. And that's why it's called the Cindy rig. And I'll tell you why. So my good friend, Steve Delia, he's retired now. He used to be on the Rapala Pro Staff with me when I was like 16. He was on it. He took me under his wing and we become really good friends. And um, he's like a local legend here and and really probably the pioneer of this really light line stuff and kind of introduced me to it. And um, one day I got a call from him and he was out fishing on Lake Simcoe, which is up here is legendary for giant smallmouth. And they get a lot of pressure because of the population around it. Well, he was out dragging tubes. And he brought his wife out and she doesn't really know how to fish and she was casting the tube out and just reeling it back like not doing anything just through the water column and that day she like absolutely smashed him like 10 to 1. and he called me and he couldn't believe it and i'm like whoa like if that was working on simcoe for those crazy pressured fish then there's something to this and that's where we really started to work with it do try this with different baits and then we eventually narrowed it down to a little minnow on a ball head and um, this is a Gamagatsu 604 in there, so it's super stout. But we basically just reel it. Like, you can do different sizes, but this is, like, a, a heavier head. Normally, if I'm fishing shallow, I'll use, like, a 16th ounce head. I'll bomb it out like a hair jig and reel it back through the water. 
just under the surface and it absolutely slays fish and will uh, entirely outperform the hair jig which everyone's throwing here now so they're just seeing too many hair jigs it gives you so much versatility because you can change the different colors of the the tails the heads you don't need a you spend hours in your basement tying hair jigs you can just buy a pack of drop minnows buy some heads and just do this technique and i, I promise you it will outfish a hair jig on most days and i know that's a big statement but i <laughs> that's a really big statement and uh, but i i stand behind that entirely and um especially with this spicy melon and travis will probably also kill me for showing that one but that's our that is a cheat code um when you hold it uh if you put that in the explain what that does once you put it in the water dan uh this this color that just that color specific it, it's Let's kinda, really make travis mad yeah i mean you can probably like it, it's on our banner there like you like yeah. uh, we showed there you probably show it Perfect. again but it glows. It, it glows in the water and so there, there's a funny story on this color too so travis manson helped us design this bait and part of that design process was bringing colors to this bait and this was a color that he wanted and i actually almost i didn't want it initially and he fought for this color he's like no it needs to be in the line i'm like well we don't really have room we already got a lot of colors and he fought for it and then the first day that i had this color we had all the drop minnows and we were actually bed fishing and i we caught a lot of fish that day and, and i'd throw them like black and green pumpkin and all the other colors and then i was like well travis really fought for this color so let me give this a shot and so i threw it in i'm fishing with matt my tournament partner and he's fishing whatever and like we're still having to work for a lot of those smarter bigger fish and like the first fish that saw this like ate it instantly and we're like whoa that was cool the next fish the next fish and it was instant every single time and then we we're like whoa there's something with this color so then we started experimenting with fishing beds but off the bed and it got to the point where fish were willing to to eat this thing like six feet off the bed and they, it was instant they would be on the bed you pass it six feet away boom they'd shoot over eat it and it was like oh my gosh there's something to this and um it's really become like the staple color in this bait for us when we're fishing lake ontario and the st lawrence it's it's our it's not the one that you would think would sell the best but it in my opinion it's it's definitely it's my go-to didn't you have like a 38 pound bag in a derby or something this past year? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, not 38. Um, but uh, yeah, it was a 32 four is like the all time record on the St. Lawrence. Uh, my tournament partner and I broke it July 1st last year. Yeah. That's, crazy day. that's epic. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. Epic. I think. This dude. <laughs> yeah. Travis was a little upset about it. Cause I think he came second or third with like 27 pounds. So we had like we were five pounds up on the entire field <laughs> yeah it was amazing it's a good day one yeah. i'll never forget it's and the crazy thing about that day is it's almost bittersweet because we lost the biggest fish of the day so i felt like we could have been closer to like how big was or, that i don't know it was one of the biggest ones i've ever hooked and it yeah like give us a ballpark because that if, if it was the biggest fish of the day it would have had to have been over seven yeah like we, our biggest one was a seven one in that bag and <laughs> this fish dwarf that fish i i mean people Yo, see, you actually like saw it yeah this one we saw it was right beside the boat like we were on yeah. top of it yeah, yeah. Oh, and God. i hooked i hooked it i hooked it and it just screamed like it was like a freight train um and it was actually the first fish of the day so it didn't set the tone very well and then the next fish we were so wound up from losing that one that matt tried to like net my second fish and he broke the net because he put so much pressure on the net so we had no net and then we just kind of regrouped by zip net, sat there and then peak six and then another six. So it didn't start well, but um, yeah, it was pretty crazy. Epic day. Wow. Well, Dan, yes. I greatly appreciate you joining it. Frank, you got anything else for Dan? I think we're going to chat for a couple of minutes after we let Dan go. Um, No, dude. I just see it at the classic, man. I'm looking forward to it yeah I'll, I'll be there we're gonna have a great lakes finesse um booth there right at the front entrance can you buy Nascar. stuff um i'm not sure who's selling um you'll definitely be able to buy from so uh -oh. say hi right off your phone oh did i lose you guys nope we're back okay yeah, yeah. say that one more time <laughs> 
Dan. Yeah, yeah, we'll have a GLF booth there. We'll be able to show you guys all this stuff so you'll be able to see it all in person. And then um, I believe LureNet's actually doing a, a gift, like a, a discount code. So you'll be able to buy it right off the site, right on your mobile phone. We can help you out right in the Sweet. booth. Yeah. Perfect. Greatly appreciate it. I know, uh, I know this is near and dear to your heart. You can tell that you're passionate about it. And it's cool to, uh, to see this from the time where it's like, Hey, we, I remember him saying we bought, uh, bought this little or, or, or working or partnering with this like little company. And now it's like so cool, uh, to see it grow so rapidly and to have so many people using your stuff. It's got, you gotta be really proud. Yeah, so I'm really proud, but I'm also really thankful for the like the angling community and the support. And uh, you know, it just seems like the more we put out there and and give up these secrets and and try to educate people, it seems like the community really supports us even more and more. It's almost exponential. So um, we're truly appreciative of everybody who supports our brand. That's what putting out a good bait will do, man. Yeah, yeah, that's our focus. Is um, we've always had there's two things that we always like this is our motto it's one our baits are never designed to catch anglers they have to catch fish so they don't look the flashiest we don't start at what they're going to look like at the retail level it's always what do they look like to the fish and we don't care if less people buy we just want the people to buy our that that do buy our stuff to have a, a really great time and really appreciate it and then the second thing is every single bait that we make if we our team won't have it tied on in the biggest tournament of our lives it doesn't make the lineup and that's the standard it doesn't matter it has to be at that level otherwise we're not going to do it perfect well said we're gonna let you go thank you for jumping on this morning dan thanks guys thank you everybody right. take care See Daniel. You. yep bye he's got going on yeah dude it's a really unique product line um you know I I like it, and again, the thing that surprised me the most was the durability factor on them because they don't look like they would be durable, and they are. I mean, they really, yep. really are. Yeah, like my, I like. Go ahead. I just say my first experience with that sneaky underspin was on Thousand Islands, and I I basically knew what I was going to do in the tournament, so I was like, all right, I I got to go up and try this, and I had a one of those black sneaky underspins with a black bait, and I like I'm running it through the water, and I'm like, okay, yeah, I mean, it kind of looks like an underspin, but I don't get it. And I was over in Canada, and I saw like the that it was in between two islands with a current, but it was like clean in there, and I was like, I think that's, I mean, like like dude, I I drift the main river, right, like with right. a jig and a net and stuff. And I said, I think that's where they. I had, I had a co with me. I said, practicing. I said, I think that's where they throw that like sneaky underspin, like a hair jig. I tied one on and I fired it out over this rock and it's coming back. And like out of nowhere, just this big, giant, dark thing materializes <laughs> behind it. And I just keep reeling it. And then the line goes slack and I'm like, she's got it. And it was a 514. Isn't that something? And it was nuts just how smooth that fish was able to come out of a current seam, get behind it, and like it just kind of went through the bait and was going to go back. And that's that's when I let it know that it wasn't going to go back. And uh, and I I mean I was hooked on it since well, then. Like I I mean it was amazing. You know what's funny, and I'm surprised I got a box of goodies here. The the funny thing that I'm surprised about is that. Um, on the sneaky underspin, and I hope to, I should have one in here somewhere. Bear with me. Huh. You reach Frank's status, they just send you a giant box, apparently. So much stuff in it, you can't even find what's in there, huh, Frank? No, I took a bunch of stuff out to, to, to go over, and I want to find the sneaky underspin because there's a design concept to this one that's very important. Uh, I it, what I noticed was I could creep it and it would still spin, which is yes. hard to do on like an underspin. Like you could just take the spinning reel and just slowly spin it, and it was enough resistance, but it didn't. It never blew out. No, it doesn't. And here's the here's the thing that I noticed about it fishing up here because I love I love fishing grass. So. The angle of this wire, how oh, the angle of the of the drop wire, okay. Mm -hmm. If and the way they have the 
wire spun backwards on it. So the so the so this part is behind the wire. Mm -hmm. makes Clears this that thing, spinner from your it, plastic, and it makes it weedless. When you're when you come in contact oh, with yeah. the grass and you're reeling it over, it makes it slide up and over the grass. So if this thing was the other way, like a lot of them are, the other way, it that this part hangs into the grass. So th that's another feature that I really like about the sneaky underspin, um, because it gives me the ability to feather it around the sparse vegetation and not have to constantly be pulling grass off the dang thing. Listen, I want to reiterate this for the normal southern bass angler who will order this stuff. If you have spotted bass lakes, if you want to use this for largemouth, you're going to get it and you're going to go, God, this is tiny. This is small from the underspin to the craw to do not let that fool you no. with these baits. That is how they are designed. I went through the process where I was like, how in the hell is a fish going to find that little craw thing without much action in a two and a half mile current on the bottom? Do they freaking find it? And well, that's, that's what they feed on. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. And then I remembered up in Alaska, drifting a eight millimeter bead in, in a, a glacial runoff Kenai river with no scent whatsoever. And you're catching big giant rainbows. I mean, you're, you're drifting down current like this and they're finding an eight millimeter bead, yeah. just a bead that's bouncing along the bottom. So that's what these fish do. That's what they live on. Like Dan said, that's what they do. So definitely some, some cool, unique stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah, Speaking dude. of cool and unique. Okay. You got speaking a new color of, out. Speaking of cool and unique, um, there's a there's a color in the paint shop that I did called hot sauce, and, and we put it in the Norman NXS. Um, there there was a lot of guys wanting a red craw in the NXS, and uh it's there and it's available right now. Um on lurenet.com. 300 of those so we're pumping the stuff today uh like i said that's a cool color especially for right now oh yeah what else do we have we talked about the classic we talked about dan we talked about the great lakes finesse um the it was a great it, i thought that was a great show that combined both hey here's some stuff you could buy but also with the education and entertainment and the in informative part of it because there were some nuggets in there too yeah, there there definitely was. I mean, look at this the the GLF stuff. Um, it's new. It's newish to me, okay, because I've only I've only been around it for the last few years, so it's kind of newish to me. Um, I'm still feeling my way through a lot of it. Mm -hmm. I have I have, and I wish I would have brought them upstairs. I have four. 3700 is the half box, right? The half of a 3600. I believe so. Or whatever. I got whatever the smaller box is. Mm -hmm. um, I have four of those filled with GLF stuff. And then I have my tube box. And, and I have them Velcroed together. And basically, it's my that's my smallmouth stuff when I go to the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. So now I just grab the, grab the thing and throw it in the boat and i got everything in a nice neat package to ready this to go. is what i love about bass fishing so you're talking you know about finesse and dan i think mentioned three four five pound test seven six rods medium light actions talking about how you get more bites toledo bend was one on a damiki or hanging a minnow whatever six five medium heavy action rod 30 pound test braid like 17 pound test tiny fluorocarbon leader on it it's amazing how both ends of the spectrum can be equally effective in different situations with very similar baits but what oh, yeah. fujita was doing he got more bites by going super heavy and by what dan and the smallmouth, the clearwater finesse guys are doing. I know they get more bites because I've got my butt kicked by five and six pound test line before. And last year I spent nine straight days fishing with five pound test 
fluorocarbon on Oneida getting confidence in it because I was in an area where guys who were throwing four and five pound tests beat me consistently two days in a row with the same bait. So that's just part of the learning process that we talked about. Yeah, it's it's kind of bizarre. I mean, like, <clears throat> like I have rules of thumb on line size. I just don't um, see you throwing four pound tests, Frank. I'm I sorry, don't I just don't. For, I ice fish. <laughs> I just don't with four pound test yeah <laughs> i'm not yeah. i'm not I, i'm not fishing i'm not fishing with four pound test I, i'm not the lightest i go is six and that is very technique specific so you know that's just me though yeah. but i'm but i'm learning some so like so <clears throat> powell has a 763 naked which is the perfect rod for for what dan was talking about I prefer the 764 because I like, I want a little bit more meat behind the rod. I just don't want, like I have the, I have the 763s, um, but I prefer the 764, but I'm disciplined. Like I'm not going to get the bite and go, holy crap, wham. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm disciplined. So I know when I'm fishing the light stuff, it's just, I just lean into the fish. I don't crack them. I do the same thing drop shotting. Get a bite drop shotting. I just reel into the fish and land them. Um, but I'm disciplined that way because I've been doing it for a long time. If a guy's, if a guy's gets a little hook happy, um, you, you have to go to the lighter rod. You have to do it because you will be yeah. disappointed every time. All right, Frank, uh, we're an hour and 22 minutes in. Like I said, if you guys are headed to Bassmaster Classic Saturday, 1230 at the Pradco booth, Sunday Please. at noon at the Pradco booth, limited run. Once they're gone, they're gone. So get there early. Color number seven, one knocker spook. It'll be uh, it'll be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to seeing yep. everybody there. Bring um, your shirts for Frank to sign, your hats, your babies, your wives. <laughs> you want Frank to sign, bring it, and he will. Sign we will it. have we will have multitude of sharpies. I will have black and silver. Matt, yeah, I will load you up with sharpies as well. Yeah, because you're signing. Works. You're signing with me, bro. No, I, I'm your handler for Classic Week. I'm the crowd control guy. <laughs> no, no, you're not. You're signing with me. I'm saying get on here have, to meet Frank. I gotta have a partner in crime all the time. Yeah, all <laughs> right, the um, Italian way. Big shout out uh, to to Dan Miguel. Stop by at the classic. Say hi to Dan. Say hi to myself and Frank. And I guess are we going to record a show for next Thursday and run it on Thursday since you'll be driving? Yeah, let's record a show next week because we missed a couple weeks back. All right, let's record one. Can we do a show on? Have we done one on preparing for the tournament of a lifetime? And we did. Did we do one on that? No, we kind of because it'll run. Uh, we've messed around a little bit. We've done a tournament prep deal. I think we've done something similar to that. We we did we did uh organizing and packing your boat. I think yeah, we, we did. did. We I did don't know. That. We'll figure it out off air, Frank. We'll figure it out. DM hey D, DM me or Matt with a show idea, and we'll do it Thursday. All right, this has been another exciting edition of Day Four with the Man Frank Scaler Special Edition with special guest Dan Miguel. Great same place, <laughs> same time, next week, and then we're headed to the Bassmaster Classic on Grain. See you at the Classic. See ya. <laughs>